<laughs> internal cues that trigger thirst, uh, hypovolemic thirst, thirst caused by low volume of fluid. We have baroreceptors in our, in our uh, major blood vessels which detect uh, any pressure drop from fluid loss and of course that's one of the reasons why you go into shock when you get shot and you start to hemorrhage. Uh, you'll go into shock and the reason is because of these baroreceptors. Uh, they will, and the reason that you go into shock is because the, the body is trying to, to slow everything down. And if it can slow everything down, then potentially you won't bleed to death or it'll slow down the, the bleeding. It usually is caused by a rapid loss of bodily fluids such as hemorrhaging, uh, diarrhea, or vomiting. Uh, if you have an an aneurysm, of course, the blood vessel will burst, uh, in which case all the blood that comes rushing by uh, goes into your whatever. <clears throat> if it's in your brain, it'll kill you fairly quickly. Uh, diarrhea, of course, uh, causes a lot of fluid loss. A lot more than we realize because we, we uh, reabsorb a lot of our fluid in our, in our uh, uh, bowels and uh, diarrhea, of course, doesn't allow that to happen. So if a kid's got diarrhea, they, they can uh, dehydrate very, very rapidly. And for that reason, diarrhea used to be the number one cause of, of death worldwide, especially for children. And then we came up with a new formula for treating diarrhea. Um, of course, if they've got dysentery, there's not much you can do about it. Well, there is something you can do about it. Uh, but if they just have diarrhea, di you know, just simple diarrhea needs to kill kids. Um, but now we have a uh, uh, formula for, for taking care of it. Uh, diarrhea tends to be a spasm in your colon. Uh, and what you need to do is stop that spasming. And if you can stop the spasming, then, the, then they will, it'll slow down the diarrhea or just stop it completely. So if you ever have a kid with diarrhea, what you need to feed them is uh, Gatorade. And you need to replace the water. So you need to, to give them water and Gatorade, but not at the same time. Uh, so the first time they get thirsty, you give them Gatorade. That's got electrolytes in it. The electrolytes will, will stop the spasming, potentially. Uh, and then the next time they get thirsty, give them a bottle of water, clear, fresh water, and then the next time give them Gatorade again. And usually by the second dosage of Gatorade, their diarrhea has stopped. And that's what, how we're treating kids all over the world. <clears throat> so Gatorade, uh, with all of its uh, uh, minerals and, and nutrients in it, uh, actually will stop the spasm. Should I tell you my diarrhea story? <laughs> we had this little girl, she's about 12 years old. She'd had a, a urinary tract infection and they treated the urinary tract infection. Uh, then all of a sudden she came down with the most god awful case of diarrhea that we have ever seen, that anybody's ever seen. We were trying to pump water back in, or fluids back into her. We gave her an IV in her left arm. Then we gave her an IV in her right arm. Then we gave her an IV in her left leg. And then we gave her an IV in her right leg. I mean, she there was nothing we could do with this kid. She was just squirting like crazy. And of course, we're pumping fluids into her as fast as we possibly can, but we have to be very careful. You don't want to overcharge this kid uh, or you'll kill her. And of course, she's dying anyway. And we looked at her stool specimen, we, and we couldn't find any bacteria, and we couldn't find any, uh, we couldn't find any uh, parasites, we couldn't find any worms, no nothing. We couldn't find anything in there. As a matter of fact, we didn't find we we weren't growing anything out of her her uh, uh, stool specimen, which is weird because your colon's just full of bacteria. So we couldn't find anything, <clears throat> and she was hours away from dying. She was real close, and the doctor came down, and, and, and he, uh, I wasn't working in uh, parasitology or, the, or microbiology at the time, I was working in hematology, and the doctor came down, and he grabbed me, and he said, please, please, go in and see if you can find something. Of course, I had already looked, and I, couldn't, I hadn't found anything. We had one of our least uh, skilled laboratory technicians was in microbiology, <laughs> but... I went in there anyway, and so I'm looking at stuff, and, and I had a fresh stool specimen, 
it was easy to get a fresh stool specimen from this kid because she was squirting almost all the time. Uh, so we got a, a fresh stool specimen from her, and I looked at it, and I thought I saw, I thought I saw white cells in there. And so I, I, I looked at them again, and they were a little bit big for white cells. But you know, there's always a possibility. You never know what's going to happen. There's always a possibility that, that she's, you know, she's losing serial fluid. So I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I looked at it, and I said, you know, that looks like candida. That looks like that looks like uh, yeast. And so I, I did a germ tube, what we call a germ tube, where we took a, uh, a drop of the specimen and we put it in with serum, and we put it in the incubator for about an hour, and then we looked at it, and lo and behold, it, it, was, it was candida. It was yeast. So I told the doctor, and he said, oh, that can't be. Yeast never causes any problems. Uh, and then he said, well, it's worth a shot. She's almost dead anyway. So we uh, gave her flagell, which kills off yeast. And it did, killed off the yeast, stopped the diarrhea it, it instantaneously when we gave her the flagell. What had happened, they had given her a broad spectrum antibiotic to kill all of her, her uh, to kill her uh, urinary tract infection, and it had knocked out all the normal flora in her colon. And when it knocked out all the normal flora, of course, it, this is an antibiotic, it doesn't work on, on, uh, on, on a uh, uh, yeast, uh, so the uh, yeast just exploded. And, of course, it was irritating her bowel, and it's causing her, to, her bowels to spasm violently. I mean, really violently. Now, normally, if we look at anybody's stool specimen, they've got all the, all the yeast in the world in there. But the, the reality is that there's so much bacteria that it's, it's controlling the amount of yeast. So people don't react to the yeast. Well, in this case, there was no bacteria to counteract the yeast. So the, the kid had uh, this violent case of diarrhea and almost died. I mean, it was close. <clears throat> it got pretty bad. Anyway, we saved her life. Uh, I, I just happened to be the one that did it, but of course I didn't get any credit for it. <laughs> of course I didn't get any credit for it. That makes too much sense. Anyway, okay, so that's uh, high volumic thirst. Uh, osmotic thirst, uh, high volumes of solute in the extracellular fluid, uh, os uh, osmoreceptors in the brain detect any increased osmolality of extracellular fluid, and that's osmotic thirst, osmotic thirst. Hypovolemic thirst, uh, when baroreceptors uh, detect a drop in blood pressure from the tension on the artery walls, the information is relayed to the autonomic nervous system. The blood vessels constrict to maintain proper pressure uh, for consciousness, and of course, uh, otherwise you pass out course. Uh, so the uh, changes your blood pressure. The brain also releases vasopressin, the antidiuretic hormone uh, from the posterior pituitary. Vasopressin acts on the kidneys to reduce flow of water to the bladder. Hypovolemic thirst. Uh, so this would be a case if you're out in the desert. A lot of people, uh, when they're out in the desert and uh, we saw this all the time. We, we went to uh, the uh, Egyptian desert. We weren't supposed to be there. Uh, at the time, we weren't allies with the Egyptians. Uh, but the Egyptians had allowed us to set up what they called rapid deployment force ba bases. So we went out to the Egyptian desert. Now I'll tell you what, it's not the nicest place in the world. Anyway, one of the things that, uh, that happened was, this is when they, they taught us not to uh, urinate. Um, so that you can reabsorb that fluid back into your system uh, so you don't urinate. And when you do urinate, it looks like mustard. Anyway, <clears throat> uh, so that would be hypovolemic thirst. And of course, your, your kidneys uh, slow things down. And if you've ever worked outside in the summertime, you probably didn't urinate at all. Didn't have to urinate all day. Not a bad deal. You're thinking, man, if I could drive across the country with, if I, if I could just not have to stop and urinate all the time or drink anything. Uh, in diabetes insipidus, vasopressin is not produced in the kidneys, and the kidneys will not retain water. Uh, the patient is constantly thirsty, drinks lots of water, and urinates constantly. 
and that's with uh, diabetes insipidus. We don't see this so much anymore. Uh, in the old days, of course, uh, we saw a lot of type 1 diabetes, we saw a lot, of, a lot of diabetes insipidus, but we didn't see a whole lot of type 2 diabetes because people weren't eating the same things that they're eating now. People, the, the diet that we have in the United States is pretty bad. Uh, the urine tends to be almost completely clear. You can almost drink it. It's so clear that there is nothing in it. There's hardly any waste product in it. This is with diabetes insipidus, uh, where you're drinking all the time. The kidneys also detect the low uh, blood volume and release a hormone called renin. Renin triggers a protein called angiotensinogen uh, to form the protein an <laughs> angiotensin 1, which in turn becomes angiotensin 2, of course. <laughs> angiotensin 2 constricts blood vessels, triggers the release of vasopressin. It triggers the release of aldosterone, which is a male hormone. Uh, it acts on the uh, preoptic area of the brain to elicit the feeling of thirst. This is accomplished in the subfornical organ, one of the circumventricular uh, organs around the open areas of or the ventricles of the brain where the blood-brain barrier are weak. Uh, so it, it uh, will activate this organ telling you that you're thirsty. Uh, this is in the open area of your brain, the ventricles of your brain. Osmotic thirst is more common than hypovolemic thirst, and as the name suggests, it has to do with an imbalance of sodium chloride in the extracellular fluid due to a loss of water. Osmotic uh, thirst is caused from perspiration, it's caused from respiration, and it's caused from urination. <clears throat> as interesting as that is. And strangely enough, I got up probably five times last night to urinate uh, while I was asleep. And so when I weighed myself this morning, I weighed about two pounds less than I did when I went to bed last night because <laughs> I urinated so much. Why in the world did I urinate so much? What in the world was going on last night? The barometric pressure changed, if you notice. It's, it's going to be sunny for like a, forever. We'll never, we won't see any more clouds for, I don't know, <laughs> about a week, I guess, or maybe a month. So the barometric pressure changed. And because of that, it caused, uh, it caused uh, uh, osmotic, uh, not really thirst, but it, it caused uh, it forced the, uh, the water out of my system, as interesting as that is. Since we're dealing with an increase of sodium chloride in the system, this form of thirst can be triggered by eating salty foods. Uh, so potentially what I need to do now is, uh, is taking a lot of salt. But I don't feel like I need to take in salt, but I am drinking a lot. Why? Because I lost a lot of fluid last night, strangely enough, because of the barometric pressure change. Osmotic thirst uh, research shows that uh, humans have os osmoreceptors uh, in the various areas of the preoptic area, the anterior uh, hypothalamus, the supraoptic nucleus, the organum vasculosum of the lamina terminalis, and of course, here you go, right down at the base of your brain, that's where the supraoptic nucleus is. Sodium chloride balance in the body is very delicate. As we have noted before, hypertonicity uh, or hypo, hypotonicity will cause cell destruction. Uh, so we have to maintain a proper amount of, of sodium chloride. Uh, when angiotensin II is released in the bloodstream, it acts on the adrenal glands to release the mineral corticoid steroid hormone aldosterone. Aldosterone acts on the kidneys to conserve sodium, which in turn allows the individual to conserve water in the body. The more sodium you have, the more water that you will retain. So if you feel hungry for salt, it means that you're probably, potentially you're not, you're thirsty. One causes the other is the problem. So the more salt you eat, the more water you will, uh, you will take in and retain because your body has to maintain a select amount of salt. So if you put a lot of salt on your food, potentially, um, potentially you're, you're uh, hyperhydrating yourself by eating all that salt. And I, I do eat a lot of salt. 
It's about the only con condiment I use. The only spice I use is salt. Salt and pepper. Uh -huh. Kind of interesting how salt will do that to almost anything. I know with cooking, we usually what we do is like a, what I do is like a, when I um, want to use less oil or some, I'll put salt with like a, let's say I'm doing sa saute some onions uh -huh. and when that onion that onion started to dry up or kind of start burning, you throw some salt on it and it starts to almost like liquefy and it drains all the the, the, the water out. And you can use that still. Use that as a base. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. What do they call that? Reduction. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. However, humans cannot drink seawater. It is hypertonic and thus adds more salt than water, causing greater thirst. And that's one of the reasons why when you're dying of thirst on the ocean, you can't just take a drink of water. Actually, you're, you're, you'll, you'll be poisoning yourself with too much salt. While humans have not evolved to handle hypertonic uh, conditions, creatures that live in the ocean or, or are able to survive with little water uh, have kidneys that can handle large volumes of sodium chloride. And this is what we see with a lot of lizards that live out in the desert, Gila monsters and whatnot. Uh, these animals very, almost never drink water. Uh, and the reason is because their kidneys can handle uh, as much sodium chloride as they can take in. Uh, they can handle just about anything. Uh, so these animals will not die of thirst. They don't need water. Not only do organisms uh, require water and warmth to survive, but they need food as an energy source. If this were the extent of our needs, humans could eat raw glucose and live very well. And as, as a matter of fact, that's what we're trying to figure out uh, as far as space travel is concerned. We're talking about a mission to Mars. Of course, we've been talking about a mission to Mars almost as a joke uh, for decades, but uh, it looks like we're really thinking that maybe we can go to Mars. Uh, but how in the world are we going to do it? It's going to take three years to get there. Uh, so how in the world are we going to... Uh, I mean, we, we already know that uh, people can, can stay up in, in outer space for uh, 100, 200 days, uh, but uh, what happens, what's going to happen with three years? That's nine, that's a thousand, that's over a thousand days. And here, nobody's ever stayed up in, in the, on the space station, station for that long. So how in the world are they going to do it? How are we going to feed them? Uh, what's going to happen to their bodies if we, if the, we leave them in outer space for three years? And the answer, well, we already know that uh, it changes your genes. It changes your DNA. It readjusts your DNA. We found that out with the two twins. We had one, one that was an astronaut, and we sent him up to the space station. And the other one stayed here on Earth, and he did exactly the same thing that the guy up on the space station did. And when he came down, these were, these were identical twins. And when, the, when the, the guy came down, we checked him to see if, his, if anything had changed. And what had changed were, were his chromosomes. The guy was not the same as he was before. These were identical twins before, and now they weren't anymore. So it changes your genetic structure. Something else that happened uh, last summer, um, there was an asteroid that was flying through our solar system that was moving through our solar system at a relatively rapid rate. And they couldn't figure out what was going on. It was cigar shaped. So it wasn't, it wasn't round. It wasn't, it wasn't donut shaped, it was cigar shaped, so it was long and narrow. It was ten times longer than it was thick. Cigar shaped, literally cigar shaped. They have speculated that potentially it was a probe by alien creatures. That is one of the theories as to what this thing is doing out there, and why it was moving so rapidly, and why it was shaped in such an odd shape. This is not a normal shape for outer space. Normally, if something is out there, it gets knocked into a, a circuit or a, a, at least a, a lump of something, not, a, not shaped like a cigar. I know. It's gone now, so there's nothing we can do about it. But there is speculation that it is an alien creature. But if we, so if, if we sent somebody out into outer space, potentially they wouldn't be human anymore if they spent any time out there. If they were able to reproduce, 
the male, if they were, there was a male and a female and they were able to reproduce, what would the offspring look like? Would it be different? Because they were in zero gravity or whatever. Yeah. I'm going to go back to chapter 6 where uh, the hippocampus, the, the birds, and the right. birds hippocampus, and then the, um, the, male, the, the skulls of all the bird men expanding and expanding again. Yeah, exactly. It expanding with time, and then we got to the Neanderthal man who had the biggest brain. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, it shrank back down, shrank back down to something not quite the same. Mm -hmm. We just found out something about Neanderthal. Man. What was it? Something new. Uh, they were looking at uh, adolescent. Adolescence, and uh, th this was a Neanderthal boy. He was he was a teenager, and he was eaten by a bird. A bird is a bird eating, or something. Uh, what did they find out? Ah, I can't think of it anyway. I was reading it the other day. Fascinating stuff. Ah, so there's uh, there's creatures from outer space, and they fly cigar shaped uh, alien craft. Uh, should be interesting, but we know we know that uh, it'll change. I mean, things will change if we send somebody out into outer space. So it's hard to tell what will happen if we colonize the moon, for example. Uh, the gravity's less. Since gravity's less, uh, people will be different. Uh, so we don't know. We have no clue as to what will happen. It's very difficult for us to speculate about these things because it's. It's difficult for us to think beyond our own time frame. So we can't think 10,000 years into the future. Uh, we can't, we can't uh, anticip anticipate what's going to happen. I mean, could uh, Neanderthal man anticipate that his brain would, would get smaller? You know, that, that kind of thing. Could he speculate that? So we, re re we really have no, no, uh, no idea. The interesting thing is that if we did send people into outer space, and they did change, uh, would people complain about it? Or would people, I mean, we already do. We're screaming that uh, we can't clone anybody and that we can't, uh, we can't do stem cell research. Uh, you know, there's, there are already people that are claiming that this is uh, a, a religious paradigm, that, that we can't do this. Uh, so if we send somebody into outer space and they're out there for a hundred years and then they try to come back, is, will there be you know, some religious zealot someplace screaming that that's not a human, they should be shot or something? Who knows? Who knows what's going to happen next? <laughs> but I won't have to worry about it, I'm too old. <laughs> uh, Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, so we need food for an energy source. However, humans also require nutrients, chemicals that do not provide energy, but are required for proper functioning of the body. And of course, that has to do with your Gatorade that you're drinking uh, has uh, uh, minerals and new other nutrients in it that help you uh, recover from uh, losing so much sweat. Some of the nutrients that we require are in the form of amino acids, uh, amino acids extremely important. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. Uh, so amino acids are extremely important as far as humans are concerned. And of course when we talk about where did life come from, uh, we talk about uh, uh, groups of amino acids mixing together and, form and, and forming life. We've never actually been able to do this uh, in the laboratory, but we know that it, it is amino acids that have caused life, that have created life. Of the 20 amino acids required by the body, 11 are manufactured internally, and nine must be attained through our diet. So we have to take in nine amino acids. These nine amino acids are known as the nine essential amino acids. It has to be in our diet. If it's not in our diet, then we die. We need them, we have to have them. Uh, 11 of them we manufacture ourselves, and nine are the essential amino acids. Besides the essential amino acids, our bodies require 15 vitamins, several minerals, and a few fatty acids from our food. So we need to take these things in. And this is one of the reasons why if somebody drinks their, their breakfast, lunch, and dinner, 
if somebody decides they're going to uh, survive on beer, that that can work for for a while, but eventually, of course, uh, it's not it's going to stop working. And the reason is because <clears throat> they're not getting any fatty acids from their beer. Uh, they're getting almost all the vitamins that they need, at least some of them, and they're getting some of the essential amino acids, but not all of them. So eventually they're going to get depleted, and eventually they're going to start having problem. problems. I had a father-in-law once upon a time who decided he was going to stop eating. He hated to eat green things. <laughs> uh, the only green things he'd eat were green beans. Uh, and he was kind of depressed, so he decided he was going to drink beer. And he, he had read someplace that beer is the, the best food you can possibly uh, consume. So he tried that, and eventually, of course, he had a B3 uh, deficiency, and it caused him to have sores on the inside of his mouth. And the way he fixed that was by drinking beer and eating green beans. As stupid as that sounds, that's all he did. Was, and his sores, the sores in his mouth went away. I was so excited that the sores in his mouth went away. It started out as sores on the sides of his uh, mouth. It looked like his mouth was splitting open. And then he got sores on the inside. It was ugly. And his breath, oh my God. Well, of course, he drank beer and eventually he ate green beans. And that was all he did. <clears throat> anyway, uh, this was, yeah, well, anyway, we won't talk about the rest of it. These nutrients were obtained when the body breaks down complex foods into simpler forms through the process of digestion, and that's why digestion is so important. Most animals, especially humans, will build up stores of nutrients in their bodies, and this is one of the reasons why you can live off of beer for a while anyway, because your body just ma will maintain stores of all of these foods. Uh, the B vitamins, for example, are uh, fat soluble, and since they're fat soluble, uh, you will accumulate them in your body. Now the problem is if you take in too many B vitamins, you'll poison yourself. <clears throat> but uh, if, you, if, you, if your diet changes, and this is one of the reasons why humans are like as we are, is we, we will accumulate these, these vitamins and we can live for a number of, of days, months, not a year, not that long, but we can live for a while without taking in any more of these nutrients because we have store, stores of these in our, in our system. And so he was okay for, I don't know, about three or four months, he was fine. No problems whatsoever. He, he was drinking beer for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and everything was fine. And then all of a sudden, well, and it was all of a sudden. I mean, it was really weird. One day he's okay, the next day he's got, his mouth is splitting open. It was just the oddest thing, in, well, not that odd. But what had happened was he had depleted all of his B3 vitamins. And eventually, of course, he, just, he found a way to, to, to give himself B3, and that was to eat green beans. He'd eat a can of green beans a day, as stupid as that sounds. <clears throat> Don't try this at home. <laughs> I think he's dead. I'm not sure. <laughs> I haven't had very much to do with that family since I divorced my first wife. So. I went to light beer. He probably went to light yeah, to try. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so most animals, especially humans, will store these nutrients in their body. This is done because of the anthropologic ancestors tended to go through cycles of feast and famine, and the individual who could not establish stores of excess nutrients, usually in the form of fat, uh, would not survive to reproduce. And this was our problem. Uh, so humanity, we can, we can look at humanity today and we say, oh my God, look how fat they are. Um, and then that's true. We are a lot fatter than we've ever been before. Uh, but the reality is that uh, 10,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we were, we were living off the land. And if the land didn't provide us with enough meat or the land didn't provide us, if we didn't eat any vegetable matter, uh, then we didn't get all the nutrients that we needed and we died. So we had to eat these things. We had to find these things. Otherwise, our species wouldn't have survived. And that includes all humans. I'm not just talking about Europeans. I'm also talking about all the indigenous peoples around the world as well. 
All the energy we need to move, think, breathe, and maintain body temperature is derived in the same way. It is released as the chemical bonds of complex molecules are broken to form smaller, simpler compounds. And this creates heat. To raise body temperature, we release the bond energy as heat. The amount of energy used is expressed in, of course, kilocalories. And if you've ever been on a treadmill and you were watching your calorie count, you, what they were talking about was, was uh, uh, you burning kilocalories. The reality is, the bigger you are, Let's assume that you weigh 300 pounds and you get on a treadmill and you decide that you're going to walk for three miles. If you weigh 300 pounds and you're walking for three, uh, for three miles, you're going to burn a lot more calories than if somebody my weight, 185 pounds, got on the same thing and I jogged for, for three miles or ran for three miles. That 300 pound person is burning a lot more kilocalories because he weighs more. He weighs more. So the, in order to move 300 pounds for three miles takes a lot more energy than it does to take, than it does uh, somebody that weighs 185 pounds. This has to do with muscle mass too. So if you have a lot of muscle mass, then your, uh, uh, you burn uh, energy a lot more efficiently than somebody who doesn't have the same muscle mass that you do. And this is one of the reasons why, if you've got an individual that is, uh, is an athlete and they've been exercising all their lives, they don't burn nearly as many calories as, as other people do. But it takes more calories to maintain their muscle mass. In other words, when they're sleeping and, and, and they're metabolizing, uh, they're metabolizing and, and maintaining themselves, it takes a lot more um, uh, energy to uh, maintain that muscle mass than it does to, to maintain fat. It doesn't take any, hardly anything to maintain fat. But muscle mass, of course, is, is, is complex protein. And because it's so complex, it burns a lot more energy in order to maintain itself. So this is the irritating thing about, about people with muscles. They won't have to worry about gaining weight uh, nearly as readily as somebody who's already fat and doesn't have very many muscles very much muscle mass. Fat doesn't take very much to, to maintain, but muscle does. So that guy's burning, he, just by sleeping, he's burning a lot of calories. As irritating as that is for people who don't have muscle mass. <laughs> well, not all foodstuffs provide, this, this irritates my wife, and this is my poor wife. She. She's been trying to lose, she tried to lose weight while she was in the military. She had to. The military told her she couldn't weigh more than a select amount. But she didn't want to exercise. She didn't, doesn't like to exercise. So she would try to, to uh, lose weight by dieting. And it worked. I mean, it worked to some extent. If we could have gotten her to exercise, it would have been a lot easier for her because she would be burning a lot more calories. This way she's just reducing the amount of calories she's taking in. But if you can exercise and, and uh, reduce calories at the same time, you're gonna lose a lot, more, a lot more weight. Not only that, but you're building muscle mass, and muscle mass, of course, will burn calories. But I could never convince her of that. She was always looking for that magic, that magic pill that would, uh, that would take all of her weight away. <laughs> While not all foodstuffs provide energy, that which cannot be used is excreted, especially as solid wastes. So if you take it, if you eat a lot of junk food, you're going to crap a lot. And you're just going to get rid of it. It's not going to stay in your system. Or it will, it will convert to fat. Available energy is used in one of three uh, uh, activities. Processing the newly ingested food, about 33% of energy is utilized this way. Basal metabolism, maintaining the body, about 55% of energy is utilized this way, and active behavioral processes. So if you exercise, and of course my wife told me about this over and over and over again, you're only, it, it only accounts for about 12% of the uh, energy that you're using. So we've got 88% of your, of your energy is being utilized just by sitting there. Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> and only 12% has to do with your activity level. Now this gets kind of interesting. Well, no, it's not that interesting because the more muscle mass you have, the more 
uh, the, the more basal metabolism that it takes, the more, uh, the more efficiently you uh, digest your food, the more muscle mass you have, because you have protein. Yeah. Okay. And this is something I could never convince my wife, which is okay. The uh, body uses glucose as an energy source, and so it breaks everything eaten into this form. If something will not break down into, into sugar, then it, it's, not, it's not food. So, so you can't eat plastic. If you ate plastic, it wouldn't feed you. It wouldn't do anything except fill up your gut. You can't eat wood. We can't break down cellulose. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, break down into sugar. So we can't eat that. Beavers can. I mean, that's what beaver and, or ungulates, you know, a, an elk or a deer can eat the bark off of a tree, and that will feed that, that animal. But if we do the same thing, it doesn't do us any good except to fill up our stomachs. Because we can't break that down into, uh, we can't break it down into sugar. So anything that breaks down into sugar is food, is food. <laughs> Fat is food. Uh, starches are food. Anything is food. Protein. Protein, we can break down protein. Um, I was thinking about something uh, oh, with the, kind of with history and I mean, from a little bit of survival. Uh, the Donner, the the Donner, Donner Party. Park, where they, uh, got, they got snowed in and they, they used belts and boots. Sure. And sure. Pretty soon they, they consume one another. Each other, yeah. yeah. They started eating each other, which is okay. I mean, it's protein. They're, they're taking in protein. And that's what the, the leather was. I mean, you can eat leather, mm -hmm. you know. If you, eat, if you chew your fingernails off, what happens to those fingernails? Does it just get stuck in your gut? No, it breaks down, and, and eventually it breaks down into, uh, into, into something that you can digest. It's the same way with leather. Uh, you could chew on a, 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 a cow's hoof, and that would be that. Would, you could break that down into food. Anything that you can break down into sugar is okay. Anything that's made out of protein, and just about everything in the human body is protein. Yeah. Is made out of protein, or in in, in any body. I don't. Yeah. I don't want you. you I think some, some of the sauces that we make in, um, down below. We usually use on um, bones, chicken bones, sure. uh, beef bones, pork bones. They boil it down to where you can um, liquefy it, and then it's just, it turns into a sauce. And it, 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 it's, now I'm kind of getting the hang of that one, but it's it's you know it's never see the end of it. See the the start of it, but never see the end of it. Yeah, you never see the end of it. Good point. <laughs> So we store glucose in the body in our liver as a substance known uh, as glycogen. When ingested glucose is low, when, they, when you, the ingested glucose is low, the body will release glycogen from the liver to keep the brain functioning. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why you're fairly lucid. Even if you're starving to death, you're fairly lucid. Uh, as, as long as you have water, you can probably maintain yourself, even if you don't have any food. You, you'll probably still live for an extended length of time because the uh, body is breaking down your protein, it's atrophying your muscles, and you're eating your muscles or you're reabsorbing your muscles uh, just to maintain your brain. The release and breakdown of uh, glycogen from the liver is, uh, is controlled by two enzymes from the pancreas. Glucagon promotes the breakdown of glycogen to glucose in a process known as glycogen. I'm sorry, glycogenolysis. Insulin promotes the conversion of glucose to glycogen. Insulin is so, so important. <clears throat> this is where diabetes comes from. When an individual has uh, been without food for a prolonged period, either forced or due to dieting, they begin converting their adipose tissue into glucose in a process known as glucogenesis. Gluconogenesis. At the same time, they will produce a secondary fuel called ketones, which can be used by the body and the brain as fuel. Okay. Okay, let's, so let's say you're on a diet. You're on a diet and you're not taking in enough glucose to feed yourself, so you start breaking down fat. Now, how do we know that you're breaking down fat? 
we know you're breaking down fat because we can detect ketones in your system. Now, you're not supposed to have ketones in your system. That means you're breaking down fat. So normally, if you eat a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, or if you only eat once a day, you're taking in enough uh, nutrients that you won't have to break down your, your fat cells. But if you do start breaking down your fat cells, we can smell it on your breath. Ketones stink, so we can smell it on your breath. So I used to work in the laboratory, and so I saw these people all the time. 10, 20, 10, 20, okay, all right. My watch is right now. My watch was an hour ahead, and now that we flip back, now my watch is correct. I'm so excited. Uh, so when you're working with diabetics, one of the, the things you're, you're going to notice is that they, they start breaking down ketones almost right away because they're not utilizing glucose. It's, it, they're urinating it out. So they can't use glucose. So they start eating their fat, eating the fat out of their body, and they start putting on ketones. So the reality is that if you smell somebody's breath and you smell ketones on their breath, you know, you know that they're either dieting or that they've got diabetes. One of the two. What is the, what is the it stinks. It smells. Or uh, no, it smells like rotten meat. Because what, what is happening is they're taking their own, the, their own fat. Yeah. They're taking their own fat from their own body and they're breaking this stuff down. Now, fat is, is extremely rich. It, you know, you know, fat's extremely rich, of course. But this is fat that's been sitting there for a while. So it's like, a little, it's like rancid fat, which is what it really smells like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're breaking most of it down, but some of it, of course, is getting into their bloodstream. And uh, you can smell it on the ground. And it smells like rancid fat. That's what it smells. It's nasty. Okay. So why do I know all of this? Well, I know this because I used to work with a lot. I used to work in the laboratory and I used to, to uh, detect diabetes a lot. And the other thing is that my wife didn't like, didn't want to exercise to lose weight. She wanted to diet and lose weight. So she wasn't taking in enough calories. So she was burning her fat. And I could always tell when that was happening because all I had to do was get anywhere close to her face, and whew, I got ketones in the in the kit in the keister in the in my kisser. And in in essence, any time I kissed her, I could tell that she had she was putting on <clears throat> ketones. And I would tell her, and she'd get offended because it tasted it tastes bad, I guess. It didn't. Mm -hmm. So she'd go brush her teeth. And will you kiss me now? <laughs> <laughs> I kissed you before. I held my nose, but I kissed you anyway. <laughs> Long-term energy stores are in the form of fat cells or adipose tissue. Adipose tissue can be used for energy when the ready amount of glucose in the system has been depleted. Adipose tissue can be broken down into its similar, uh, simpler forms, fatty acids and glucose. Glucose is brought into the individual cells through glucose transporters. Uh, in the cell membranes. So each cell, the, each cell in your body has to, has to uh, have energy. The energy in this case is glucose. There is no other energy that we can utilize. It has to be glucose. Glucose transporters can only function when they interact with insulin. And this is the problem with a diabetic. They don't have, either they're not putting off enough insulin or their, uh, their cells have become insensitive to insulin. That's type 2 diabetes. But if, if their pancreas isn't producing insulin, of course, that's type 1 diabetes. Uh, in the old days, we, uh, type 1 diabetes, we only saw it with, uh, in kids. It always started in, when they were kids. <clears throat> and they'd have to take insulin shots. Of course, back then, we didn't have the insulin pumps and whatnot. So they'd have to take insulin shots. Now we're seeing adults who are developing in, uh, di type 1 diabetes. We had never, we've never seen that before. This is something brand new. We used to see rare cases of type 2 diabetes. Now it's all over the place. Um, I don't know why. Well, sure I do. People are eating junk food. Stupid, stupid food, yeah. yeah. They're eating junk food. 
Uh, whereas before there was no junk food. Or if there was junk food, uh, it was a treat that you got, you know, once a month or something. But now uh, people are, are living off of McDonald's. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or in the case of Chin Lee, it's Burger King. Mm -hmm. Except for brain cells, which do not need insulin to function, otherwise diabetes mellitus would cause such severe brain damage that it would be instantly uh, deadly. Uh, diabetes mellitus, uh, the brain cells do not require insulin for them to convert uh, glucose into energy, but all the other cells of the body do. So the brain will maintain itself, even if you have diabetes mellitus. You'll be fine. It's not going to destroy your brain cells. But, of course, the rest of your body is going to break down. And this is one of the reasons you can tell if somebody has diabetes, the type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, because uh, they start putting out ketones. And they start urinating uh, glucose out of their bodies. Because they're not utilizing it. And if they're not utilizing it, they, their body just gets rid of it. So we can see it in the urine. You should never have glucose in your urine. Never. If you have glucose in your urine, it means you're either diabetic or pre-diabetic. If you're diabetic, then, then your body can't use it. You'll, you'll have to take insulin in order. You have to take insulin shots in order to utilize the glucose. There are three phases that the body must go through to, to be able to utilize glucose in the diet. The cephalic phase, the digestive phase, and the absorptive phase. I used to have a friend who was, um, he's dead. He, he died of diabetes. <laughs> but uh, when I met him, he was diabetic. He was in the first grade. He was a diabetic. Uh, and he had to take insulin shots every morning. He had to give himself the insulin shots. In the old days, they, they gave your insulin shots in your gut. So you, you had to, you'd pee, you would pinch a, a chunk and then he'd give himself an insulin shot. Or he'd give it in his thigh, but it hurts more when you stick it in your muscle. Anyway, so he did this all of his life. Well, he decided he wanted to be a hippie, which is cool. It's cool. He grew his hair long. Wore greasy clothes. That was okay. Never washed his hair. That's fine. The problem was he wanted to be a hippie that was cool. So he wanted to be a hippie that drank a lot. Well, you can't do that if you're diabetic because alcohol turns into glucose right away. So he figured out a formula so that he could, uh, he could take a shot, he would give himself a shot of, uh, extra shot of insulin so he could go out and, and on a bender. Now this works kind of, but it can only work for like eight hours. You can't do this for three or four days because you'll get too drunk and you won't give yourself the right amount. There's always a possibility of breaking the needle off, which he did on numerous occasions. He broke the needle off, especially if he was shooting into his thigh. Uh, he would uh, he'd break the needle off, and he'd have to go in and have, have it surgically removed, you know, that kind of stupid stuff. So he could only go on a bender for, for about eight hours. He could, but he had this formula where he gave himself extra insulin, and then he would go out and drink. If he couldn't get to the alcohol quickly enough, he went into insulin shock, which happened a couple times. Idiot. You know, he would be planning to go to the bar and get drunk, and he'd get sidetracked, or he'd get stuck in traffic or something. You know, something stupid would happen. The same thing, the exact same thing happened to uh, uh, a singer in the group. Uh, he, he didn't tell nobody he was diabetic. Uh -huh. He would take insulin shots and he would perform at the same time he would party. <laughs> I guess one time he got them all mixed up and he was going off stage and just flat, fell flat on the floor. Is that right? People thought he was using drugs and he had to explain why he was taking it. Well, he was drinking alcohol. <laughs> uh, yeah, this guy was that stupid too. Hmm. As dumb as that is. Eventually he killed himself. Not, he didn't shoot himself. He died of diabetes because he couldn't uh, regulate his, uh, he, he got the formula wrong uh, at, at select in instances. And he destroyed his liver. He destroyed, he destroyed his kidneys. Uh, and eventually he died. he died young. He was like in his uh, 37, 38, 39 years old he died. 
so there's three phases that, that the body must go through to be able to utilize glucose in the diet. The cephalic phase, the digestive phase, and the absorptive phase. The food itself acts as a stimuli. The sight, the smell, and the taste of it evokes a conditioned uh, release of insulin in the anticipation of glucose arrival in the, in the blood. Of course, this guy didn't have, he, didn't, he wasn't producing any insulin at all. So if he anticipated, so he had to give himself a shot before he ate, but he also had to give himself a shot before he drank. In this phase, the release of insulin is regulated by the brain and is thus referred to as the cephalic phase. So the brain is telling uh, the, the uh, uh, pancreas to produce insulin and to shoot it into the body so that, that uh, uh, you can digest your food. Now you don't even have to think about this. There's not much to it. Um, just the sight, the smell, and the taste of food will induce uh, an insulin surge in your system. In the digestive phase, food entering the stomach and intestines causes the release of, of the gut hormones. Uh, this stimulates the pancreas to release more insulin. During the absorptive phase, glucose enters the bloodstream and special cells in the, in the liver. The glucodetectors and the glucostats detect circulating uh, glucose and signals the pancreas to release more insulin. There we go. And that, is, that has to do with... Uh, digestion. Uh, so initially you're just taking it into your stomach. It takes about 20 minutes for it to start uh, emptying into your intestines. And this is the reason why if you take a pill, it's going to take about 20 minutes for that pill to get into your system. Uh, it takes about four hours for your stomach to completely empty. Let's say you decided to eat lunch or you just ate your whatever that stuff was. Yeah. That'll stay in your system, uh, that'll stay in your stomach for about two, three, four hours. Okay. Depending on how complex it is, the food is. If you eat nuts, is, were there any yeah, nuts in there? Nuts okay. In there. Well, nuts are very complex. So it, it, and this is one of the reasons why eating nuts is a really good idea, because you're going to get all the nutrients out of them, and they spend a lot of time in your stomach, you're, you digesting them. Uh, and you get a lot of you get a lot, get a lot of nutrients out of them. Mm -hmm. So if you eat nuts, it will stay in your system for an extended length of time, which is a good thing because you won't get hungry again. So if you eat nuts, you won't get hungry again for at least four hours. Uh, it takes the, takes it that long to empty out of your stomach. So if you eat a meal, this happens to me every time I go down to visit my son, because my son is a bodybuilder. So he, he's got all this stuff regulated. So he'll go and eat, <laughs> and then he'll go lift, which doesn't make any sense to me at all, because it takes like four hours to get that stuff out of your stomach, and he'll eat, and then he'll start, he'll uh, go and lift uh, an hour or two later. He he's, does everything really slow. He's like a sloth, my son. So he moves really, really slow. It takes him an hour to eat food. <laughs> no matter what it is, <laughs> takes him an hour. So he's, he's really kind of funny. And I'm going down to visit him. <laughs> Probably come back as big as a toad. <laughs> but he burns it all off. Like he's, uh, for one thing, he's got such such a, a, a developed muscle mass that he burns food just almost instantaneously. Uh -huh. So he has to eat three meals a day. He has to. And he has to take in protein in order to maintain his muscles. So he takes, he eats a lot of meat, eats a lot of pasta, he eats a lot of carbs because he needs all that, uh, that instant energy. Uh, he eats a lot of Mexican food, strangely enough. I haven't quite figured that one out yet. <laughs> Insulin allows the, what's his favorite place? Uh, the place that got into trouble because they weren't cleaning their vegetables. What was that place? That's his favorite Mexican food. He gets to make his own burritos or something. Huh. What is that place? I can't think of it. Insulin allows the body to, to either utilize the glucose immediately or to convert it into glycogen. 
Uh, if it burns it immediately, and this is this is what happens if you uh, you uh, well, what happens with my son when he goes and, and he eats lunch or eats one of the burritos from starts with a Q. Quiznos. Quiznos. It's not Quiznos. Quiznos is Italian. This is this is Mexican food. Mm -hmm. Ah, I can't think of it. Anyway, so he'll eat this stuff. And then he'll burn it all off when he goes and lives. And because he'll burn five, six hundred calories. Uh, and of course, he's only eating a burrito and chips or, and salsa or whatever. So he's only taking in about six hundred calories. He's burning the whole thing. So he doesn't convert any of that into glycogen. He very rarely eats when he doesn't exercise afterwards. He either runs or he lifts weights. He's also getting his master's degree in mathematics. Theoretical mathematics. The stuff that he studies isn't even. Makes sense. It's not even human. There's not, <laughs> nothing human about any of this stuff. <laughs> it, and the people that teach it are like, oh, they've all got Asperger's syndrome or, or autism. <laughs> so literally, it's not human at all. Well, it is kind of human. The nerve that passes information from the liver to the brain and back to the pancreas is the vagus nerve, the infamous vagus nerve. Uh, the vagus nerve is very important, and luckily it's in the middle of your body, so it's very difficult for you to damage your vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs to the nucleus of the solitary uh, tract in the brain stem, and of course it tells your heart when to beat, it tells your stomach when to digest food. Diabetes mellitus is the lack of insulin uh, uh, causes this, uh, the fact that you don't have uh, uh, insulin. Type one, uh, type 1, which we used to call juvenile onset, but we are seeing so many people with adult onset diabetes, type 1 diabetes. Uh, the first guy I ran into was a baseball player at Ashford, uh, had developed type 1 diabetes uh, at 17, and I and I had never heard of that before. But we have a professor here that has diabetes. And he didn't develop it until, until he was in his 30s. And he developed type 1 diabetes. He never saw that before. There's just something going on. Something going on in people's diets that is, is causing them to develop type 1. Their insulin to just shut down completely. Their pancreas to just shut down completely. We've never seen this before. Though the brain can uh, still utilize the glucose from the diet, the rest of the body can't, and so utilizes fat stores instead. And that's one of the things that, that happens. So if you see this guy, he's as skinny as a minute. Of course he is, because he has type 1 diabetes. If he eats food, he can utilize that glucose. However, he doesn't store, he doesn't store any fat, so he has no fat on his body. He doesn't have, they, there is an insulin in his system to convert the glucose to glycogen and the glycogen to fat, to store it. So he doesn't store any fat. Since most of the dietary glucose cannot be used, it passes through the system and is excreted in the urine and that's when we detect it. And this is one of the reasons why if you are diabetic, uh, you check your urine all the time. And what you're checking for is to make sure that your medicine is working, you're not taking in too much glucose, uh, and if, if you do take in more, more glucose than you need, you have uh, sugar in your urine, you have glucose in your urine. Glucose can also be converted to glycogen and stored in the liver. Uh, diabetics are hungry because the body tells them to consume energy, but they can't gain weight because they do not store glucose as fat. Uh, had this old man come in. Uh, he had developed type 2 diabetes. Uh, old, old man. And uh, he was a colonel. He was a colonel in the army. And this is when I was in the service. And he came in and uh, all he had to do, I was drawing his blood. And of course I'm, you know, this far away from him. But I'll tell you, the ketones coming off that guy would have knocked you down. And just about, I just about started throwing up. And here I'm trying to draw his blood and everything. Anyway, he, we, <laughs> we drew his blood, uh, and then we ran a glucose, and it was so high that, that we had to dilute it. It was too high to detect, 
so we had to dilute it. Eventually, uh, we determined that his uh, glucose was over 500. Normally, it's around 100, and this was five times normal. So his daughter came in, oh, she's so worried about him, she's so worried about him. This lady is, it looks like a bodybuilder, but she's not a bodybuilder, she's a, she's a party animal. So she comes in to, to see the old man, and I, I could smell her from across the room. It was that bad. She had diabetes, too, and she didn't know it. Um, and she didn't want to admit it, was, which was the strange part. So, of course, we can smell the, the, the ketones. Some people don't smell things. They don't smell things at all. And here she was, I mean, she just came in the door and started breathing, and we could smell the, the uh, well, for one thing, we could smell the alcohol, but we could also smell the we. Why don't I talk in we? I could smell the ketones. I could smell the alcohol. I knew that she was diabetic. So I tried to tell the father that I thought that his daughter might have the same problem because of the odor that's coming off of her. And of course, he told her and she just got all, she went ballistic. She ran off. And she didn't want to do anything. She didn't want to have her blood drawn. She didn't want to take care of anything. Until, of course, she went into acidosis and collapsed at a party. And they brought her in and she was almost dead. <sighs> You know, if you if you almost die, it's really hard to to not admit that you've got a problem. So, at that point, we we tried to regulate her diabetes. She didn't want to. She was like 22, 23 years old. She didn't want to settle down. She was partying all the time, having a great time, consuming a lot of alcohol. She was everybody's girlfriend. But I don't know how in the world they got anywhere close to her because she was putting off enough ketones to 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 kill somebody. To kill me, anyway, if I was that close to her. Anyway, I couldn't stand to draw her blood. She hated me, anyway. I was the one that, that first identified her, her diabetes. So evidently, it was my fault. Before that, she was perfectly happy. She was just partying all the time. Now, all of a sudden, she had to watch her diet. She couldn't drink so much. It was my fault. <laughs> uh, of course, when she was almost dead on that gurney, and they rolled her in, and I had to draw her blood. Of course, she, of course, she's almost dead, so she's got no blood pressure, almost no blood pressure whatsoever. So I'm trying to draw blood from a rock. You know, it's that bad. Of course, I'm dead from that anyway. Ran the glucose, and found out that she was, she had a higher uh, glucose level than her old man did. It's like 600. That's that's like my Seventeen? Type two? And he's big. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And that was that that's my cousin's. That was my cousin who passed his past August person. Yeah. She had diabetes too? She did. Mm -hmm. And she didn't know that that was part of her part of you got to maintain your entire body. I mean, if you've got diabetes, it means that you're not feeding all your cells, and one of the areas is your heart. Mm -hmm. And see, she didn't know. Well, um, my cousin's boyfriend said that. He kept telling her, you know, to check, but she never did. She was going to school at NIU, and she was a student. So she did go in. <clears throat> well, she wasn't partying, and that's the reason she didn't go in. Well, she, I think they were that weekend. She, she, <laughs> <laughs> and that's what killed her. Yeah. That's what gave her a heart attack. You know? Yeah, congestive heart failure. You can't maintain that much body, that much mass around your heart. That's what congestive heart failure is. Mm -hmm. uh, you start, um, your, your heart uh, uh, cleans all the, the moisture out of your lungs. It, you know, the, with the beating of your heart, and your respiration, you're, you're, you're getting rid of all this moisture because it's very moist down there. If uh, your heart is, is malfunctioning and it's not beating properly, then your lungs will slowly fill up with fluid. And that's what congestive heart failure is. 
So when somebody breathes, if they're, they're, they're in congestive heart failure, you can actually hear the fluid in their lungs. Mm -hmm. Sounds like they have pneumonia or they have pleurisy. You can hear the fluid in their lungs because their heart isn't, isn't beating efficiently enough to, to get rid of all that moisture. Mm -hmm. Because normally, of course, we're, we're breathing moisture all the time and my heart's beating correctly and I'm putting off enough. Uh, so I have no fluid in my lungs whatsoever. But if I did have, it sounded like I had, it, my, my, uh, my breathing would rattle. It sounds like you, uh, you uh, can't clear your throat quite right. Mm -hmm. But that's the way they breathe all the time. It's congestive heart failure. An individual like that, if they lay down, uh, puts more pressure on their heart, puts more pressure on their lungs. Uh, that's usually when they, they have a crisis. It's when they lay, lay down. When they're standing up, the gravity is is trying to force the, it's forcing the fluid in your lungs down to the bottom of, the, of your lungs, for one thing. But if you lay down, of course, now the gravity is evening things out, so, yeah. Yeah, my dad almost died of congestive heart failure. <clears throat> and, of course, my mom knew it, because my mom's a nurse, and she's watched this, people die from congestive heart failure all the time. And she got mad because it was uh, Labor Day, and the doctor didn't want to do surgery, so. She got mad. <laughs> she got mad. She was going to let the old man die. <laughs> She'd show those damn doctors, bastards. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I was there, and I knew exactly what was going on. My brothers and sisters are Duh, you know, ignorant. I have no clue. So just my, my mother and I knew that uh, my dad was dying. And... Uh, and you could hear it. I mean, you could hear him when he breathed, was breathing. It was hot. It was like 100 degrees. This is in Indiana. Humid? Oh, my God. Cause so, so he was taking in almost as much fluid as he was expelling fluid. And uh, so finally I told her I knew what was going on and it, that she needed to call the doctor. She didn't want to, but I made her do it. <laughs> so the old man lived for about 15 more years. <clears throat> because I had just happened to be there and I heard him dying. Anyway, so I saved the old man's life. And my mother almost killed him. <laughs> Jeez. What are we doing here? Uh, di diabetics are hot. Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, treatment is, is uh, to provide exogenous insulin. Exogenous, of course, means outside the body. Uh, so we can treat somebody with di type 1 diabetes uh, with, uh, with insulin, with uh, uh, insulin. We, in the old days, we used to use sheep insulin, but we're not doing that anymore. Uh, we have synthetic insulin. And that's why the, uh, we have the, the uh, insulin pumps. It's a, it's a synthetic. It took us forever to figure this stuff out. A lot of people died because we couldn't figure it out. Diabetes mellitus type 2, adult onset diabetes, uh, is a milder form of diabetes, but usually does not affect an individual until they are adults. Uh, there's two causes of this type of diabetes. The cells gradually lose their sensitivity to insulin. That's usually what we see around here. The body gradually decreases its production of glucose. Uh, this type of diabetes is more common among obese people and can usually be controlled by reducing the amount of glucose in the diet. And this is the problem, and we, we talk to people about this. You can not cure your diabetes, you'll always have diabetes, but, the, but you can re, if you reduce the amount of glucose in your diet, if you, control, if you exercise and reduce the amount of, of glucose in your diet, you can control these, this diabetes and it won't kill you. But what happens? People don't want to change their lifestyles. They're used to a select type of food, fatty foods, fried foods, pizza, uh, pizza sure, drinking sugared cola. Uh, that's what they're used to. And you can't get them to stop. And you can't get them off their fat ass to exercise. And so they die from diabetes because they're too lazy to stop eating the, uh, all, all the, the bad foods 
and they're too lazy to get off of their tails. They have to do it. Or die. And so they die. It's really a tragedy. Because all they need to do is change their lifestyle. It's the same way with drugs. If we can change their lifestyle, we can get them all. It's a tragedy. Uh, of course, we can also give them uh, medications to stimulate their pancreas to produce more insulin. And that's usually what we do. We give them metformin, and metformin uh, makes them produce more insulin, and now we can take care of it. Uh, the problem is, of course, uh, and sometimes it's uncontrollable. Uh, sometimes they, they start eating uh, next to nothing, uh, no sugar. Uh, my sister-in-law had uh, type 2 diabetes, and she stopped eating white foods because white foods had dairy products in it. Dairy products were made out of fats. Uh, so she stopped eating everything white. And that worked for, for a while, and then her kidneys shut down, of course. And she decided she didn't want dialysis, and then she died. Oops. These kinds of things happen. All right. We need to.